Well, you know, industrial statistical analysis, Dirk, it's one of the most consistent areas and focus of interest amongst our faithful QD audience. Yeah. However, you'll notice, if those of you who watch the show a lot, that Dirk and I rarely <laughs> cover this topic here on Quality uh, Digest Live. Why, why is that, Dirk? Why is that? I wonder why I that is. Know. Well, quite frankly, <laughs> it's no surprise to any of you out there, neither of us quite have the chops to really delve into the intricacies of statistical process control, big data, and design of experiments and the like, but fear not, because on today's show, we're gonna be helped out by one of the leading statisticians working in the field today. He's the Chief Technology Officer of Stat Graphics Technologies, as well as the author of the recent book, Process Capability Analysis, Estimating Quality. Neil Pahimus, welcome to Quality Digest Live. Hey guys, thanks for inviting me. Hey, uh, Mike, um, I'm sorry, Neil, as, as Mike mentioned, um, neither one of us, uh, <laughs> you know, we're statistically illiterate. I mean, we can just, you know, barely count our change. Um, and I know that that's probably also true of a lot of people in our audience, mm -hmm. and yet these same people have to make decisions about their company's processes and outputs, and very often they do it with a minimum amount of knowledge of statistics, or sometimes they just grab a piece of statistical software and plug a bunch of numbers in it and hope it comes up with the right thing. Is that dangerous? You know, I gave a talk last week at a symposium here in Virginia, a symposium on data science and statistics. One of the speakers showed a slide that dated all the way back to the 1960s that showed how data should be analyzed. Now, there were three individuals standing there. One was a computer operator. His task was to grab the relevant data. On his left was a statistician, and on his right was a subject matter expert. Now, the message of the slide was that none of the three had all the skills necessary to properly extract and interpret the relevant information in the data. You know, that said, I'm a big fan of teaching data analysis techniques to subject matter experts. They're really the only ones who know whether something that appears to be statistically significant has any practical significance at all. In the era of big data where everything is statistically significant, you know, where all of your p-values are zero, practical significance is really paramount. On the other hand, because you have a large number of variables you do need some statistical expertise to find the needles in the haystack. <clears throat> so to answer your question, yes, it can be dangerous to run statistical models that you don't understand. But it can also be dangerous to let the statistician analyze data when he doesn't understand the process from which it came. The idea of us all working together, data scientists, statisticians, subject matter experts, that's what it's going to take going forward. It's interesting, I hear you say that, it reminds me of that classic story we always talk about with the blind men and the elephant, right? Right. It's like they all kind of have their own little piece of the elephant that they're, that they're kind of touching and they're like, well, it's like a tree or it's like a, a, a whip or whatever. I mean, right. that's kind of analogous right. to the same thing you're talking about here. Well, it's, and it's been that way since 50 years, for 50 years at least. That was the 60s when that was first, uh, that slide was first made. Yeah, and with more information, it's only getting worse. Well, you know, you and I had a conversation uh, that we published in, in Quality Digest uh, earlier this week where we talked about a lot of, a lot of these issues, and, and I hope everybody out there will, will have a chance to read it. Um, one of the things that you talked about in there was uh, sampling bias um, and kind of the danger of, of mm -hmm. sampling bias. Um, and of course, that's going to negatively affect the reliability of, of any analysis. So what are some indications of bias that you think our audience should be aware of going into an analysis? You know, I had a, a really great privilege of learning statistics from Stu Hunter. He's one of the best known industrial statisticians. He's authored many books, uh, including Statistics for Experimenters, written many articles. One thing he taught us was that all data are not created equal. You know, you can have a lot of data, but if the relevant factors were never changed, or if multiple factors were changed in unbalanced ways, it's hopeless to expect to see what the underlying relationships actually look like. In the case of designed experiments, we're moving more and more toward computer-generated designs, you know, optimal designs, so that sort of thing. And what you see is a lot of interest in something called an alias matrix. Now, an alias matrix shows how effects that are not in the model, 
interactions perhaps bias the effects that are in the model. In fact, our 18.2 release that will come out with this fall, a maintenance release, will add a method for obtaining what are called alias optimal designs. Those are experimental designs that are constructed in such a way that it minimizes the bias caused by these external effects that are not in the model. Now, in general, though, it's a question of making fair comparisons. If you're trying to compare two methods, perhaps a, a new method with an old method, it's important that you hold everything constant as much as possible when you collect those uh, different data sets. And that requires much more than a computer program. It requires uh, intelligence sampling. Well, Neil, you work with a lot of clients, um, and, and I think it's fair to say that you have your kind of your ear to the ground when it comes to uh, what people are doing and what they need to be doing. What are some of the things mm -hmm. that you think people are struggling with uh, as it relates to technology? Of course, technology is changing very quickly, but technology right, and quality right. and how that affects the outputs that, that people are trying to, to improve. Well, you know, uh, paradoxically, the biggest problem right now seems to be that we have too much data. <laughs> You know, it's always been the case that getting your data in the right format to be analyzed is huge, a huge task, often takes longer than doing the analysis. Now that you have thousands of uh, variables and millions of records, uh, the task of getting the data in the right format is even harder. <clears throat> At the same time, what you find is that when you're working with big data, many of the statistical methods that we've all learned which are based on small sample statistics, don't work anymore. You try doing an analysis of variance or regression, and we're used to relying on p-values to tell us whether something is statistically significant or not, right? When you have millions of data points, those p-values are always going to be zero. I mean, rounding alone is enough to make two huge data sets appear to be significantly different. There's also a strong move underway these days toward the use of machine learning techniques that rely on fast computers. These are techniques that weren't around when people my age went to school. You know, and they're also not covered in many Six Sigma training programs. I'm talking about classification trees, random forests, clustering, neural networks, bootstrapping, and so forth. So what it's going to require is a fair amount of retraining. And finally, there are also big challenges in trying to visualize big data. I mean, you can imagine a scatter plot of a million data values, right? It looks like a black blob. It's not very useful. So what we need is new methods for visualizing these millions and millions of records that people have. Well, Neil, even if, even if it's, when you say visualize, do you mean mm -hmm. literally the way we visually display this data? Or are you saying there is different types of statistical processes or analyses that have to be done when you're using big data as opposed to when you're using small data? <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of the models that we use, regression analysis, analysis of variance, and so forth, they're still useful. I mean, an R-squared statistic, for example, is still a good summary of how well you fit the data, even if there are millions and millions of observations. The problem comes when you want to see a plot of the fitted model or a plot of the residuals, that sort of thing, because there's just so many observations that it's hard to pick out the interesting ones. But there are techniques. There are things like hexagonal binning and so forth that let us make useful plots even when we do have millions of observations. Well, and everything we're talking about here really is, it comes down to this idea that you, you have data, data is, is fairly easily accessible these days, but information, mm -hmm. you just mentioned it there, really is what the end game is, is to derive information from that, actionable information. So how True. do these world-class companies take that data, turn it into information, then use it to improve their processes? Well, you know, the best companies, and the best companies, I think data analysis is part of the culture. 
you know, they do evidence-based decision making, right? Decision makers in those companies insist on facts, not opinions. Whether we're talking about marketing, we're talking about R&D, we're talking about day-to-day -day operations, there's really no excuse today not to support your recommendations with data. Now, the best companies also worry about quality, not just today, but also out in the future, right? They do things like accelerated life testing, time series forecasting. All of these are vital to be sure that the quality you build into your product today is still there throughout its useful life. And I think the final thing you see in the best companies is that they look at the data in real time. You know, they don't just collect the data, file it away, and pull it out when they have problems. They look at it on an ongoing basis. And they're also certain that the uh, people that are running the process, not just the supervisors, have a chance to see the data. You know, if they own the data, they're much more likely to do what's necessary to make a quality product. Well, Neil Palhumas, thank you for joining us today on, on our show. Neil is, the, of course, the, the CTO of Stack Graphics Technologies. He's also the author of the recent book, Process Capability Analysis, Estimating Quality. So, Neil, thanks again for joining us here on Quality Digest Live. Well, thank you, I enjoyed it. We'll talk okay. to you soon. Thanks, you, Neil. Neil.